I just uh, polished off a big gulp of coffee. So just wait till that caffeine kicks in. And I've already had too much already this morning. Would you stand with me? Because since I'm going to be standing for the next hour, you might as well just stand just for two minutes, maybe three. I'm beginning a series this morning that I've decided that I'm going to entitle it, Go for Broke. My text is found in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 51, verse, verses 10 to 17 we're going to read. These are the words of David. David said, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings, but verse 17 is my text verse for this series. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, Lord, will not despise. You can take your seats. Go for broke. Now, often when we hear the word broke or broken or broked, we immediately begin to think of negative. We get negative vibes from it, don't we? We think of hopelessness. We think of endings. I remember as a child singing Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty, poor Humpty Dumpty. He was a large egg. And he sat on a wall. I don't know why, but he did. And then it goes on to say, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I sang that all the time. Imagine now children crying, weeping. Because of poor Humpty Dumpty, broken, fallen on the ground, smashed into pieces, children scarred for life. A little exaggeration. Because of poor Humpty Dumpty. No one could put him back together again. So many times we do get negative thoughts and images when we think of the word broken. But did you know that there is a brokenness that is good? And that's what I want to address this morning and for the next few weeks. For example, an unbroken horse is a dangerous horse. It's out of control. It's wild. My friend had a, when I was young, had a horse named Daisy. Daisy had a little colt. And this little colt got out of the, the fence, fenced in area. John said, would you help me catch the colt? I know nothing about horses. Colts, and so I chased after this colt from behind. I'll catch this wild, out of control colt. Well, it kicked me in the jaw, and so it laid me out. Never forgot that kick to the jaw. That's why there's that little bend right here, right now, on my face. Out of control, a, a horse that is not broken is a dangerous horse, and we know that we talk about breaking the horse. Cowboys talk about breaking the horse, so it's usable, so it won't throw you off or kick you off. An unbroken horse is a dangerous horse. An unbroken dog is a dangerous dog. We talk about house breaking a dog. We talk about submission. We teach a dog, don't bite my friends when they come up to my house. We teach it to have respect for people. We teach it to shake hands, shake a paw. But you see, an unbroken dog is a dangerous dog. An unbroken child is a dangerous child. If that child is, remains unbroken, that child will grow up to rebel against the laws of the land. 
That child will grow up to resist authority. That child will grow up to be in constant trouble. You know what they used to say, spare the rod and spoil the child. In my home, it was spare the strap and you'll spoil the child. And we used to hide that strap. And then mom would really be mad. That's kind of dangerous to say, but that turned out okay. But maybe in today's terminology, we should say, spare the lecture and you'll spoil the child. Spare the time out and you'll spoil the child. Whatever the case may be, we've got to have children submit to those who are in authority over them, and they must be taught when they're young. For if we as adults and as parents do not teach our children well, they will not grow up to obey the laws of the land. And so an unbroken child is a dangerous child which will grow up to be a dangerous adult. There, I got my piece said right there. You see, there's a brokenness which is healthy. There's a brokenness that has benefits. There's a brokenness which is productive and which is needed. And so in this New Year's message mode that I'm in, I want to encourage you in 2017, let's go for broke. Go for broke. What does it actually mean? Here's a one meaning that I found. It means you take the most extreme or risky of the possible courses of action in order to try and achieve success. It means you will do whatever it takes. It means you'll go to the wall. Go for broke. Okay, now if you take that definition to the world, take it to the streets, take it to those that are outside of the knowledge of God's word, They'll give you an example. They'll give you a meaning. They'll tell you a good definition of what you should do. This is what you should do. Take it to the world, and you get a human flesh man definition. But you take this to the Word of God, and you'll get God's definition of what you should do when you speak about going for broke. You see, for God, the way up is always what? Down. And for God, the way to the front seat is what? Take the back seat. For God, the way to life is death. For God, the way to win is to surrender. For God, the way to real joy and fulfillment is to put others first. To God, the way to receive is to first give. You see, that is the extreme course of action God's people must take when we speak about going for broke. So God says there's a brokenness that is good for you. There's a brokenness that is excellent. There's a brokenness that is God-honoring. Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus is attracted to the broken. He saves spirits that are crushed. They might be crushed by sin. They may be crushed by failures crushed by mistakes or crushed by a fresh realization of bad actions and choices. Remember when you gave your heart to the Lord? And maybe you're here, I'm assuming, but maybe there's some here that have never given their hearts to Jesus. You can do that this morning. By full surrender, just giving him your life, inviting him to come into your heart. But remember what it was like. It might have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You remember what it was like when you gave your heart to the Lord? You were broken. For me, I was bawling my eyes out. I was just hauling on the, it was actually rolls of toilet paper. That all, we ran out of Kleenex. We ran to the bathroom, pulled down, and we were bawling our eyes out. We were broken before God. We realized that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we needed salvation. We were broken and melted and crushed. Remember what that was like when you first gave your heart to the Lord? Oh, you were crying and you were sobbing. You were broken. Norm Lowe's, his funeral, as I said, is going to be next Saturday afternoon. His wife told me that he could never get over the love of God. And he would often cry and tears would well up in his eyes because he would think about the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. How could God love him that much? He could never get over it. 
And Norm is the kind of guy, he was so positive. What a joy it is for me to share a message next Saturday afternoon about Norm. But remember what it was like when you first discovered that Jesus loves you. And that there was actually a salvation plan for you. That you could be rescued. You could be set free. And God wants us to maintain and keep that, that atmosphere, that, that, that way of life that is broken, that we, re we remain broken constantly and over and over again throughout the remainder of our life and our Christian journey. You see, there's a crushing, which can be good for us. Here's a great recipe. Place ice cubes and frozen berries. Oh, I'm getting hungry already. Juice and honey and protein and Yes, even vegetables. Put them in a blender, press that button, and let it crush and smash all around in there. Like that. Too much coffee, that's all. It's kicking in. And what happens when you do that? You have a wonderful, wonderful smoothie. Oh, there's a crushing, which is good. There's a crushing, which is so beneficial. Isaiah 57 and verse 15, God says, I live in high places, and and a holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. In other words, what God is saying is that he comes down to the lowly. He comes down to the contrite. If you get down low, God will raise you up. If you get up too high, God will raise you down. Raise you down? Lower you down, knock you down, flatten you out. That's just the way it is with God. That's the way it is with his words. That's backward success. That's backdoor entrance. Another scripture says, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, says break up your unplowed ground. Go ahead. He says break up your unplowed ground. We do it. Sometimes, oh God, do something. Maybe God says sometimes you take a move. You make a move. God helps those who help themselves. God wants to work with you. God wants to work with those who want God to work with them. That's why Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There are things we, we got to work out what God's working in. And so what the Bible is saying is, break up that unplowed ground. Break it up, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. My acreage in the summertime, August, when it's hot and when it's dry, the land gets rock hard. Back in the, probably 2003, I planted about 500 trees. Maybe a year later, I planted some other trees in the front yard, just kind of placed them in certain areas. And I remember how hard the soil was. I tried a shovel, nothing doing. I had a jackhammer in the garage that was motivated. It was driven by air. The little jackhammer. So I'm out there with a jackhammer trying to get a hole big enough to get a tree in. Later, when I got smarter, someone said, if you put some water around that area, the next day would have been softer. Why didn't you tell me that before? Break up your unplowed ground. Stir it up. Because when it's hard packed, it's not usable. It's not soft. It's not pliable. Do you realize that we need to be broken for God to use us? Some people have a desire. They, they vocalize it. I want God to use me. But they refuse to be broken. You've got to be broken. If we're not broken, God cannot use us. Jesus referenced hard-packed soil. He said it's unusable ground. He said it's, un, it's not productible ground. In Luke chapter 8, and verse 11 and 12, he said, when the, Lord, when the word falls on hard-packed soil conditions, it bears no fruit. What happens is the enemy snatches the nuggets of truth away from the heart because of a lack of penetration into the soil. And so we must pray daily, God, 
I want to break up my soil, and I'll break it up. And God, when I break it up, I want to be used by you. I want to receive the word. I want to obey the word. I want to do the word. I want to be empowered by the word. I desire the Holy Spirit to flow through me. And God says, and break up your unplowed ground. Stir it up. Get the big tiller out there and start churning the soil over so that I can get my word in you and so that my word goes out of you and flows out of you. That is real living. That's reaching your potential that God has for you, getting the word out. The song goes like this, the chorus. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Break me. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. And then use me. You see, it's, you can't just stop at fill me. If Acts chapter 2, the upper room, if the apostles would have stopped there, fill me, they'd have just exploded right there. All you'd have had is explosion. All you would have had is nothing. But they had to go out into their world. They had to take that power from within and distribute it out to all they come in contact with. We cannot stay in the upper room. We cannot stop with just fill me. But once God breaks us, once God melts us, and once God molds us, and once God fills us, then he uses us for his honor and for his glory. That must be our prayer in 2017. God, break me. Go for broke. Go for broke. What does it take to answer the call to foreign missions? That someone would just give up a job, a good-paying job, and go on short-term or long-term missions. It takes brokenness. What does it take to answer the call to pastoral ministry? It takes brokenness. What does it take for Pastor Pedro to, to pastor the Spanish church and, and Pastor Matendo to pastor the African church? It takes brokenness, a caring for people, a love for people. What does it take to stop and help a needy person in the name of Jesus? It takes brokenness. What does it take to stop and share your faith testimony to somebody? It takes brokenness. You've got too much, too much love, too much joy, and it's just not fair that they don't know what that is all about. And so God breaks you, and you're broke, and God uses you, and you go out and share your faith. It takes brokenness. What does it take to sign up to be involved in BG Club or Kids church or nursery, tech ministry and ushers or worship teams or musicians. It takes brokenness. What does it take to be involved in opportunities to bless? There's supporting missions and missions endeavors that we lay before our congregation and our fellowship. It takes brokenness. You've got to be broken in order for God to use. You've got to be broken in order for God to his spirit to flow through you to others. You see, we'll do very, 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 very little for God. And that's for broken. There's a brokenness which is very, very healthy. Very healthy. It enables God to get in us and through us and actually control our very lives. Now let's get back to David, my text, David. At the time of his downfall, 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read of his downfall. He was actually at this time king of Israel. They tell us that he was probably in his 40s at this time. He had put some amazing victories under his belt. Amazing victories. Remarkable military feats. He extended the borders of Israel, and he secured them against the surrounding nations. He was sitting good. He was riding high. In fact, David was the most powerful man in all of Israel. People were singing the praises of David. People were lifting him up, high-fiving him. Oh, David, you're so good. David, you're so great. David, you've done so many things. David, you're so wonderful. David could have had anything he wanted, anything. You name it, you got it. And so one day David is out taking a stroll on his rooftop. 
He gazes over to another rooftop, and he sees a lady by the name of Bathsheba bathing. I want her. I can have anything I want. I want her. He sends them, go over there, get her, bring her over. And so they go over, bring her over. He sleeps with her. It gets worse because she had a husband. His name was Uriah. David said, now I'm going to get rid of Uriah. I'll put him on the front lines. The next battle that we go into, he's going to be on the front line so he gets killed. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. He was killed. Then we go to the next chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan, the prophet of God, to David. And David is confronted. Now David is completely broken before God. David records his response in Psalm 51. David is now at the lowest place in his life. Never been lower. He's crushed and he's smashed. What will David do? David could have ran from the presence of God. David could have rebelled and said, feet do your duty, I'm out of here. Try to get away from God. But he didn't. He embraced God's presence. He cried. His brokenness was profitable. And David didn't look for the nearest scapegoat. David didn't try to shift the blame. David didn't try to offer excuses. No. But David owned it. I am responsible for me. I am the one that committed this great sin. I did it. So David knew at this point that God was not interested in him bringing a sacrifice. Oh, he says in Psalm 51 and verse 16, if that's what God wanted, I, I would have done it, but it's not. David knew the sacrifice God wanted was a broken spirit and a contrite heart, sorrowful heart. Melting heart. Oh, the best place that you can find yourself before the Lord is on your face crying. Shedding tears of brokenness. Melting before the Lord. And David was kind of, that's where he was. Melted before God. He got down really low. He humbled himself. He repented. He shed tears. Oh, he cried out, do not cast me away from your presence. I couldn't take it. Please, God. And God didn't. And David cried out, restore to me the joy of my salvation. What a prayer to pray. And sometimes we lose the joy of our salvation over the years. We forget what the cross and Jesus Christ did in our lives. And we've lost our joy. We've lost our fulfillment. We've lost our fuel. We've lost a smile. We lose it all because we forget the joy we once had because of not being melted and broken before the Lord. So David said, restore that joy because he knows he lost something because of his sinful way of life and what he did, great sin he committed. Restore it, God. And it was granted. Then he cried out, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. I had Uriah, a good man, a husband, killed. Oh, God, I can't take the guilt. I can't take the pain. And he cries out, deliver me from the guilt of this. And God does. And then he begins to make commitments. He cried out, he cried out, he cried out, and then he commits. He says, I will teach transgressors your ways. So here we are again now where when you're broken in all the right places, God begins to use you. And when you're broken in all the right places, you want God to use you. And so he says, now I'm going to teach others what I've been through. Don't go through what I went through. Well, open my lips, God. Now I'll declare your praise. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. He now wanted God to use him. Oh, the last thing David ever wanted was for God to bypass him. Oh, it was David that wrote in Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants after God. 
I long to have you in my heart and life. I long for you just like that deer pants for the waters. I must have you. And so the last thing David ever wanted was to lose out with God. Oh, flesh moved in, yes, but so did the Spirit of God move in afterwards and say there's a future, there's a hope. It's called breaking before God and God coming in and God rescuing and God redeeming and God setting you back up. You see, if you exalt yourself, God will abase you. Brokenness. Let me share with you now. I'm going to entitle it Biblical Truth Shockers. You have to brace yourself. Your flesh is about to scream out in agony, in silent agony, please. Your flesh is about to be confused. Your flesh is about to rile up and be opposed. Let's start. Number one, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. Luke 9, 24, 26. Number two, if you want to be lifted up, you must humble yourself. James 4, verse 10. Number three, if you want to be the greatest, you must be the servant. How are you doing so far? Wow. This is rough. It is rough. It's rough. The whole flesh is just, I don't even want to talk about this right now. The flesh is just, or maybe that's coffee. I don't know. Hard to say. Number three or four, I don't know. They're not even numbered. I don't know which one this is now. If you want to rule, no. If you want to be the first, you must be the last. Matthew 19, verse 30. And if you want to rule, you must serve. Luke 22, 26 and 27. If you want to live, you must put to death the deeds of the body. Romans 8 and 13. If you want to be strong, you must be weak. Isn't it amazing? You try to be strong, you end up being weak. But if you're weak, God makes you strong. Does that make any sense? Okay, if you want to inherit the kingdom, you must be poor in spirit. Matthew 5 and verse 3. And lastly, if you want to reproduce, you must die. John chapter 12, verse 24. How did your flesh take to that? When flesh hears this, your flesh, my flesh, all flesh, It's like rubbing a cat the wrong way. A cat won't like it one little bit. Try it. It's like chasing parked cars. Does anyone ever chase parked cars? They're parked and you're moving and you connect. It hurts. Try it. That's what it's like. Oh, my goodness. What is God saying? This is so absurd. You know, Paul said, I have to die daily. I have to die daily. Not just once, not 20 years ago, every day. Why do you think this is behind me? We want you to see it lit up. The cross. David found himself often at the foot of the cross. David said, I crucify the flesh with choice because these things I just read to you, your flesh doesn't like it. My flesh doesn't like it. i got to be honest with you. And Paul would say, my flesh doesn't like it, so what do I do? I take this flesh and I crucify it. Not literally, but spiritually. I go to the cross and I say, flesh, you must die. You must surrender. I die daily. I crucify the flesh. He said, I put off the old man. He's making some choices, just like the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He is doing this by choice. I take the old man off, and I put on the new man, which is created after God. Paul said, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Oh, yeah. Paul found himself visiting the cross quite often. Quite often. Paul said, the life I live in the body, 
I live by the faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me. What a great statement. The life I'm living, I live by faith. I put my faith in the one, the Son of God, who actually gave up his life for me. I visit the cross daily. I'm always there. That's the only way. It's the only way you're going to remain broken. It's the only way you're going to go for broke is to visit the cross often. I mean, if the cross teaches us anything, it teaches us, you and I, brokenness. Jesus said, this body was broken for you and for me. If the cross teaches us anything, it's brokenness. Jesus' resurrection came as a result of his death. And then Jesus invites us to die with him. The Bible teaches that. We, we die with him, so to speak, in a spiritual way, so that we may rise up in a resurrection way to a new life. Identification, that's what Paul talked about, identifying with Jesus when he went to the cross and when he suffered and bled and died and resurrected. I have a new man living within me because of it. All I know is that broken people are powerful people for God. I, I, I've traced a lot of the greats. Corey Ten Boom, broken, broken. God used, used her in such a powerful way. Mark Buntain, broken before God. Broken people are powerful people. You want to be a part of a powerful church? Be a broken church. You want to be a part of a church that changes its surrounding and changes its community? Be a broken church. Be a broken church. So that God can... Use you mightily. Go for broke. In 2017, Jesus went for broke. Paul went for broke. And now it's your and I, you and I, our turn to go for broke. Thank you, God. Your word is rich. Your word is life giving. Your word is filled with instruction. Your word speaks against the flesh. It always has from beginning to end. And God, we want to be people of the Spirit that listen to the voice of the Spirit and resist the voice of the flesh. And God, we have a desire to be used by you. But God, you tell us, if you're not broken, I can't use you. And so God, I pray for my brothers and sisters as they get up tomorrow morning, begin their week, work week. May they get up with brokenness. May they get up and say, God, break me today that I may share the good news with someone who's lost and doesn't know the Lord. And God will do it. God will open up the doors and we'll be mightily used by him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Stand with me. And if you'd like to receive ministry as we conclude in the song, just step out and join us at the front and we'll minister to you.